Good morning. I am so excited you're here. Uh, if we haven't met, my name's TJ, uh, pastor here at the Shore Church, and we are a church that is alive. Amen. Uh, and uh, are you alive this morning, everybody? Yes. Wow. What what a great day. Uh, we, we have an awesome opportunity in front of us as a church. Uh, coming up at the end of December, there's a holiday you may have heard of. Cr- Christmas, anyone? All right. Um, and so we as a church, and Christmas Day this year is on a Sunday. So, so you guys are like, well, what does that mean, TJ? Uh, it means that we're not having Sunday morning service. We're actually going to do two services for Christmas Eve downtown at Five Points Park this year. Isn't that cool? That's awesome, right? It's an amazing opportunity for you to reach out to people around you. We're going to have two services, 4.30 and 6.30. So if you have commitments later on in that evening, you can come to the 4.30 service, not miss church that weekend. Um, and, then that, and we'll do it right there downtown. It's an amazing, amazing event for us. Last year, we only did one service. We packed out the entire park uh, with people. So we're going to do it twice. And so hopefully if you have later on commitments, you can come early. And if you don't and you want to do it a little later as a family, because I know a lot of us, this has become our tradition, our, our, our Christmas Eve tradition is to go downtown, sing out the carols downtown uh, at Five Points Park. It's an amazing experience. So we're going to do that on that Saturday evening. We are not going to have Sunday morning service. Spend it with your family. Enjoy a little bit of time together. And then the next Sunday is January 1st, and I do expect you to be here on that one, all right? I, I, maybe I'll give Red Bulls to everybody who's here for first service, okay? Second service, you're on your own, okay? All right, all right. But seriously, we're going to have a great time. It's a great outreach season. People, people um, don't hurt more in this season, but they feel their pain more in this season between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So, so be a light. Be a life to the people around you. Be a church that is alive, all right? So last week I kicked off this series, The Church is Alive, and uh, we, we, we took on some pretty cool things uh, last week, and we started with four different areas of your life, that, four things that God wants to do in you, because God has a plan and a purpose for you. God has something for you, because you are the church, and you are alive, and we want to keep moving forward in our relationship with him, and it starts with one place, and and I've got these four things on the screen with me this week. The first place all of this starts is where we know God. We have, to, we have to have a relationship with God for God to work his plan through our life. So it all starts with knowing him. And if you're here this morning, you feel like God's a million miles away or you don't know God or you've never really gone all in on this uh, follower of Jesus thing, I want to talk to you at the end of the service and help you know how to start this, okay? So, but it all starts there. It all starts with knowing God. The, the next step for all of us is find freedom. God desires that every single one of us will be free. Because when, when we become a Christian, is our life perfect immediately? No, there's still some junk there, right? There's some stuff from our past we're still working through. There's some anxiety over the future. There's some, there's some addictions that we're trying to get rid of in our life. And so God wants us to find freedom. After we know him, he wants us to find freedom. The next thing in all of us, this is for all of us that God wants to do, is he wants us to discover our purpose. Because all of you were made with purpose. All of you were made on purpose. And God has a plan for you. And then once we discover what that purpose is, we can go out into the world around us and we can make a difference. And that's what this series has been about, making a difference. But you know what? We can't make a difference here unless we start with the other three, right? So on a Sunday morning, we we invite people to know God every single week. Uh, through finding freedom, we, we invite people to find freedom and grow relationally with other people and to find freedom from their hurts of their past and their anxiety over their future through our connect groups, our small group ministries. Discover Your Purpose, we do that through our growth track, which happens every single second service. Four steps in the growth track. Get in there, do it, run with it. Discover how God uniquely made you to change the world. And then, then once we do those things, we get to be a church that is alive. We get to make a difference. That we get to make a difference. Last week, I kind of focused in on knowing God and how we can reach the world to know God. This week, I want you to find freedom. I think every person in this room, God has some freedom he can bring into your life. And God knows that you cannot get to making a difference. You can't change your world until you have allowed him to find freedom within you. you, you until we allow him to work within us to find freedom over those things. God knows this. So he's, he's, he's gifted us with his son, Jesus, to help us find freedom over things going on in our life. God knew this. In the Old Testament, his people, the Israelites, they were slaves to the Egyptians. You guys remember this story? You ever watched the Prince of Egypt, the Disney thing, or Charlton Heston with the beard and the, and you know, all that, 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 the deliverance of God's people out of Egypt. He, he knew that they could not become the people that he called them to be while they were in slavery to the Egyptians. So, so in Exodus chapter 3, 
God appoints Moses to do something about it. But he doesn't just say it, hey, Moses, go. He actually, he shares his heart with Moses. We get to see the heart of God for his people here. And I think it's the same heart he has for you and I. And it's, it's incredible. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10 says this. Uh, the Lord said, and this is him talking again to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. God is watching and he sees. He sees you in your spirit your situation right now. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. So so he he not only just sees, but he hears. And then I love this. And I am concerned about their suffering. God feels what we feel. He feels what we feel. And so what does he do? The next next part of this verse says this. So I have come down. I haven't just blind, like seen it and forgotten about it. I haven't just heard it and turned a deaf ear. I haven't just felt it and ignored that feeling. No, no, no. I'm coming down there. You, you, ever, you ever grow up in a house where dad's like, oh, don't make me get out of my chair. I'm a dad now, and I say that. Isn't that crazy? If I have to get up, I'll just be angry about this process because you're not, right? Like, the, the, here's God. He goes, I'm going to do something about this suffering. I've seen, I've heard, I've felt, and now I'm coming down there. Now I'm, co- I'm, I'm coming, I'm going to give them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians. And, and I'm going to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He goes, I'm going to take you out of slavery and make you a people group. I'm going to give you your own nation. And then he turns to Moses in verse 10 and he says this, I love this. And he goes, so now go, I'm sending you. But God, I thought you were coming down. He goes, yeah, I came down and I talked to you. But what? What What are you talking about, God? He goes, I want you to be the one that does all this through me. I I want to use you to make this happen. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And as you can imagine, Moses is like, uh, uh, but, but, and he comes with all these excuses. But you know what? I think God looks at all of us today, and he looks at the world around us, and he goes, I see the hurting, and I hear the cries, and I feel their pain, and I'm coming down, and I'm speaking to you to go out into the world to do something about it. I'm sending you, I'm sending you. So, so today, if, if, if God's sending us, there's some things we need to do about it. We need to see like he sees, we need to hear like he hears, we need to feel like he feels, and we need to do what he's called us to do. And that's my whole message today, those four things. Let's start with seeing. Number one, see. We, got, we have to see as God sees. Well, it, it's really easy for us to look around the world and go, well, I'm okay, and they might not be okay, but that's okay. I'll just turn a blind eye to it. You ever, you ever notice that? How, how the person holding the sign on the side of the road, it's really easy just to position your car so that little part on the side over there, you can't see him anymore? Some of you laugh because you're, you, you, it makes sense. Some of you guys are quiet because you're like, ooh, he got me, right? Okay, okay, right? It, it's, 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 but what we need to see as God sees. We, we need to see, we, in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus saw the crowds differently than the disciples. Look, look how he looks at the crowd. When he, that's Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were like, they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He, he looked at people and he goes, they're searching for something. But everything they try to dive their life into, it isn't satisfying. They're, they're wandering around hoping that something in their life could lead them to where they need to be, to where they would be fulfilled, where they would find a, a satisfaction in their life. They're, they're wandering and it's just not working for them and he has compassion on them. I, I love the song we ended the worship with. It says, our hope forever, the name of Jesus. Our hope, our hope. Jesus looked at the crowd and he goes, they've, they've put their hope in the wrong places. I look at, around right now and I see a lot of people putting their hope in things that can't actually bring them hope. Our hope forever is the name of Jesus. Our hope is not in a candidate. Our hope is not in a person that won or lost an election. Because in four or eight years, they're gone, and Jesus, our hope, is still remaining. Does that make sense? So our hope forever cannot be, can never be what that is. And so Jesus looks at people, and I think we should look at people with the same compassion, the, the world is ranting and raving, and we're going, but your hope isn't in that. Your hope can be here. We see as he sees. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, number two, we hear like he hears. We need, we need to hear like he hears. People are crying out, and I, I kind of just gave you the example of that. You go on social media, are people crying out right now? 
And you're going, I'm crying out too because these people are driving me nuts, right? (laughs) Have you ever noticed how it's easy to turn a blind eye, but it's hard to turn a deaf ear to something? Like, like I have dogs in my neighbor's yard. I don't have dogs. My, de- my neighbor has dogs. <laughs> and they like to bark. I have a wooden fence. I didn't even know they had dogs. I could not see. I could ignore completely. But at 10 o'clock at night when that dog is going off, oh, it's hard to ignore it, right? I, I, it's hard to ignore a call. And it, it's not good for me to do something about that call because it's bad for pastors to poison their neighbor's dogs <laughs> at the night. It's bad. It's, uh, you would lo- I think I would lose my pastor card if I did that. Um, I would never, ever think of harming a, a nice, fluffy animal like that, unless they're barking at midnight, man. Come on. Anyway, that's a different subject. It's hard to ignore a cry out, isn't it? But when you hear something, when we hear it the right way, when we hear it God's way, we go, oh, wait, wait, wait. They're, they're not just crying out because they're, they're whining or they're, they're messed up. They're, they're crying out because they put their hope in a source that, that, isn't, that can't hold their hope. They, they put their hope in a place that just can't fulfill them. Our hope forever isn't this world. It's Christ and what he can do in us, the freedom he brings us. Now we can bring that freedom to the world. God sees, God hears, and God, number three, God feels. He had a concern for these people, for his people, the Israelites. He said, I want to bring them out. And when we feel what they feel, And when we feel what God feels, all of a sudden we look at people differently, don't we? We begin to understand. We don't villainize people, but we feel. Feelings matter. When I'm not much of a counselor, and I don't do much counseling with with married couples or anything like that, but but if somebody walks in my office and 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 a couple sits down and they're very like just calm and quiet, and they go, Yeah, we're having troubles, I mean it's just not working, and we're we're pretty much done. And then another couple walks in, and they start yelling at each other and freaking out and, 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 and getting angry. Um, the couple that's louder and more vocal about it is usually the couple that's more likely to make it than the ones that have no emotion whatsoever. Because there's still passion there. There's still something to fight over. And you're like, TJ, you just made me feel good about fighting with my spouse right now. Right? <laughs> I'm not saying you should yell at your spouse, okay? I am not, I am not condoning that. But what I am saying is we need to feel something. We need to have passion for something. Uh, have you ever noticed what, when you take a kid, your kid to the playground and another kid wipes out, you're like, oh, that'll leave a mark, right? Like just, new scar, buddy. Good job, right? Like that's, that's what you do. But when it's your kid, where are you? You're like, oh my gosh, come here. And you got snot and tears running down your shoulders from them, right? Like it's just whatever. Why? Because you feel it more when it's your kid. I, I wonder what this world would look like if a bunch of people started going, this is my kid. This is my city. This is my neighborhood. This is my workplace. This is my family. This is my relationship to the world around me. What if we felt something like it was our kid? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a little bit different? What, what would the world look like? And we would actually just, we wouldn't just feel it. We'd actually do something about it if we felt that, didn't we? Right? James chapter 1, verse 27, this verse really really kicked me when we were starting the church. I was thinking about starting the church, and I was like, I don't know, God, should I do this? Should I not do this? And then, and then I read this verse, and it was like, God just kind of like hit me with a rock. You know, he's like, hello, McFly, like this is for you, man. This is, this is yours. James chapter 1, verse 27, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father. Time out. Pure and genuine religion. When you, when you read that, you go, okay, well, I want, I want to be pleasing to God, and, and, and what kind of life, what kind of religion, what kind of life of, of giving and living pleases God? He goes, I'm about to tell you. So that made me perk up when I read this verse. He goes, he goes it means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. That's one thing. And two, refusing to let the world corrupt you. That's the second thing. If you want to please God with your religion, the way you live out this Christian faith, two things. It's super simple. Care, feel, love people, the widows and the orphans. Give of yourself to make this world a different place. Use the love of God to share your life with someone else. And then refuse to let the world corrupt you. Don't let the world define you. Let God define you. It's like the difference of saying um, when you're caring for others, it's like that's my kid. Versus letting the world corrupt you going, well, that's somebody else's problem. 
Well, that, don't we have a government program to cover that so that I can just be in my church over here by myself using my freedom of religion to do whatever I want except help people? I, I'm sorry, I just offended someone, didn't I? It's okay. I love you anyway. All right, so, but isn't that true? So many times we, we, we feel something, but we do nothing. But God doesn't set that example for us, ever. When, he, when, 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 when injustice happens, God goes, you know what, I need to do something about this. That's what he did with the Israelites. He, he, he found a man, and he said, you know what, I'm going to use you to make a difference. And I think we need to take that same attitude. I see it, I hear it, I feel it, and then I got to do something. That's number four. I got to do something with my life. I got to step out. I got to make a difference in the world around me. Jesus was an incredible example of this. He didn't just look at the people and have compassion for them. He actually did something. He provided for them. He, he talked to them. He, he befriended them. He had relationship with them. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. It, Jesus says this about himself. For the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, came to seek and save those who are lost. I didn't come to point the finger and write a mean blog post or have a Facebook status that is angry eyebrow person, you know. I, he didn't come to do that. He came to actually do something. He came to seek and save the lost. People were hurting. People were distant. People were broken. And when we relate to God, when we have that relationship with him, we can help others from our freedom find freedom as well. He sets us free so that we can help others be free, to go out there, to make a difference, to do something about it. In this last week, we've seen our nation do a lot of things, but not all of them are good. I think there's a lot of people who see, hear, and feel, and do something, but they're not doing good. They're actually doing something completely different. You see, I, I, I was at our Uncommon Kids ministry yesterday, and I love, love the leadership there because they see bad, but they do good. But there's a lot of people in our world that, that see bad, and they do bad, or they feel the bad, and they do bad. You see, when, when the leadership of Uncommon Kids, they, they saw bad, they felt the bad in the world, they go, but I'm not going to do bad back, I'm going to actually do good. That, that our two-county region of Sarasota and Manatee County, is, is, Manatee is the leader of, of overdoses of drugs in our, in our state, they go, well, I'm not going to just sit back and do nothing, I'm going to change a generation, I'm going to do good. That they felt it, but they didn't retaliate, they actually made a difference. Does everybody see the difference? Moses, Moses he, this was not the first time God stirred his heart for the Hebrew people, for the Israelite people. In fact, the first time he was stirred, he was, he was living in Egypt in the house of Pharaoh. And he went out to the Hebrew people, his people, that he didn't even know was his people, because he was born a Hebrew, hidden, whatever, you know the whole story. Okay, if you saw the movie, hopefully you did. All right, and so there you go. And he goes out there, and he sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite person, and he felt the pain of that Israelite person, so he killed the Egyptian. Felt bad, did bad. Felt bad and then did bad. And, and then he, had, he ran away. And 40 years later, God goes, remember that feeling that you had inside of you? That bad feeling? He goes, that still should be there. But instead of doing bad, I actually want you to do good with it. How many of us feel bad? We do. We, we, see, we see it. We hear it. We feel it. But what are we going to do about it? We need to do good. And that's not a Facebook status, okay? That's not a blog or a sign. It's like loving another person who isn't like you. Helping another person. If you're a Republican, hug a Democrat. If you're a Democrat, hug a Republican. Third party people, we're just going to pray for you. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. All right. We need to find a way to feel the bad but do what? Do, do good. We need to do that. James chapter 4, he takes it a little deeper. He says this, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, look at this, it is sin for them. I remember reading this verse as a young Christian going, are you kidding me? I just got my act together so I could stop doing all the bad things I was doing. And now you're telling me if I don't do the good things, that's wrong too? Ah, right? Like, it just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, oh my gosh. So, so if it's within my power to do something, I got to do something. I, I can't just idly buy and go, go why, well, you know, that's something else over there. That, it should, we should feel 
the injustice of human trafficking in our area. We should feel the injustice of a, another generation growing up to be a statistic in the court systems or the prison systems or the, the drug addictions in our area. We should feel that. We, we need to feel that. If God's going to change the world, it's going to use a group of believers who are all in on him. Like Moses, he says, go, and we respond. And we speak and we feel the bad, but we do good with our life. Proverbs 3.27 kind of reiterates what, what James is saying. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. When it's in your power. See, God's never going to ask you to do something you can't actually do. You may think you can't do it, but doesn't mean he can't use you to do it. When it's in your power, which means we need to take whatever resources available to us. Do we have life? Let's use our life. Do we have money? Let's use our money. Do we have a car? Let's use our car. Do we have, do we have influence? Let's use our influence, right? Do we, do we have a platform? Let's use that to help someone, make an impact, change the world. And in doing that, the world will see that the church is alive and we serve a God who is very much alive. And that's what we're here for, aren't we? Let me wrap these four things up in a thought and then we'll, then we'll move on and we'll close out this message. The goal isn't to live on earth forever but to leave something that does. You're not going to be on earth forever. I can guarantee you that one, right? There's not a person in this room that will be around forever on this earth, but we can leave something behind that actually does outlive us. We can leave a legacy. Every single one of us can do that. We can make an impact and a difference in the world around us. If we see, hear, feel, and do something about it, we got to do something. And so that's why we started, our church started, um, we, well, we started Uncommon Kids as a nonprofit because we wanted to do something. But we also started, uh, last week, we, we kicked it off, our kingdom builders. Because we want to build God's kingdom because that will live way beyond us, right? And so we opened that up. And, and Kingdom Builders, I, I went into a pretty good amount of detail last week, so I don't want to dive in too deep. But if you want to get all the detail, it's on YouTube, it's on our podcast, on our website. There's a lot of sources you can listen to or watch it. But, but, our, but our Kingdom Builders are, are people who have decided, you know what, I'm going to build God's kingdom with my life. That, that my life isn't going to be just led for me in my kingdom. Now, does that mean you can't have anything? No, no, no I'm not saying that. I'm saying we need to live so in order to build God's kingdom too, to build it. So how do, what is a kingdom builder? A kingdom builder is someone who gives above and beyond what God has already asked them to give. So, so there's two main areas of giving in the Bible. One is called the tithe. That's a percentage-based giving on, that goes to God's house, God's work. So people uh, can walk into the church doors and experience the gospel, give their life to Christ, and find the freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference, like those four things. That's, that's what that is going towards. And then above and beyond that, that's what's called an offering. The Bible calls that an offering. So I tithe. That's what God asks me to do. That's obedience. And then above that is an offering, which God calls generosity. So if we, we want kingdom builders to be a generosity sort of thing. I want to change the world with my generosity. I'm making a choice to do this. That's generosity. So, so there's four different ways, four lanes in our kingdom builders that we've taken on as a church to make that happen. All right, so four giving lanes uh, are right here. Uh, the first one is short projects. This is basically a building fund. Uh, we, we as a church, uh, we're growing. Uh, we, we are limiting out our, our kids' space. We're limiting out our parking um, a lot of weekends. And so there's just not a lot of room for us to grow. And, and so as a church leadership, we've, we've been praying. We've decided, you know what, there's, we need to do something. And we feel like we can more effectively reach more people with the gospel in our area from a more, more permanent facility. Now, I don't know what that's going to look like. Is it leased? Is it uh, purchased? Is it land purchased and then built? That, I mean, that is everything from $50,000 all the way up to like $6 million. There is no limit on the shore building fund. We're just going to start that for the first time, okay? Uh, the second lane is our local missions. And we are working primarily with Uncommon Kids to make an impact. So $25,000 will fully fund Uncommon Kids in their partnership with one elementary school in our area for the year for the year. And so we've already started that ministry. We've already started giving towards that. And so this month we've had our, our outreach day. That was yesterday. Um, we also have an 
opportunity to provide Thanksgiving meals uh, for kids and their families. Uh, of course, Christmas, and then throughout the rest of the year, we're doing things like our Day of Hope. If you've been around here for a while, uh, you're familiar with that, where we do backpacks, school supplies, haircuts, doctor and dental visits, the whole thing. This $25,000 fully funds our partnership with one school for one year. Uh, and then, so that's our local missions. The second one, or sorry, the third one, is our national missions. Uh, $30,000 for church planting. The number one evangelistic tool in the nation today. More people find Jesus through church plants than anything else in the United States. So if we want to change our, our nation, this is where we go all in. So we want to plant a church just like ours in another city somewhere around the world. And so it's going to take us $30,000 to do that. We have a goal by the end of 2017, we're going to plant another church. Isn't that awesome? All right, so... Very cool. All right, and then the last one is international missions is where our overseas projects go. Um, and so we've got a mission trip coming up in June, early July, uh, late June, early July, where some of this funding will go to support the projects we take on in the Dominican Republic. Uh, some of this will also go to send kids to school in Durban, South Africa. That takes $150 for the year to send a kid to, to school in Durban, South Africa. Um, for $1,500, we can put two kids in a house uh, in Durban. And so... The, we can, we can, our dollar goes a long way over there, overseas. And so that $25,000 can do a lot of good. So you can see here that there's $80,000 in goals that we have, but our overall goal, our large goal is 150000 that we can put into building fund, that we can put into different projects. And my hope is to not just fund this alone, but to do so much more with the impact we can make here locally, nationally, and internationally. That's what we're doing. So I want to do something about this. I want to change the world. I, can't, I don't think we as a church can sit by and go, yeah, you know, well, I feel the bad and I see the bad, but I don't really want to do anything about it. Well, no, no, <laughs> that's not the gospel. That's not what God created us for. He actually created us to make a difference in the world around us. And we will find ultimate fulfillment in our life when we, when we go out of our way to make an impact on the people around us. I got one more passage for you, and, and then we'll wrap up. And I, I love this story. It comes from the book of Acts, chapter 3. Uh, it's, it's a quick one, but let me read it to you, and then we're going we're gonna to be able to see these four things at work, all right? Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called Beautiful Gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. And he says, and then it says, Peter and John looked at him intently. L let, me, let me pause right here. Of our four things, what do we see in action? Did they see this man? Yep. Did they hear him? Yep. Were they concerned for him? Well, that's inferred. I believe it's inferred. But what about the last one? What about the do something? What, what is their reaction to this man? He says, Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly expecting some money because that's what he was asking for. But Peter said, I don't have any or silver or gold for you. Can, can you imagine the disappointment that kind of sunk into this guy's heart? He goes, look at me. Yeah, what do you, what, you got something? You got something? No, I don't have what you're looking for. Oh, well, that stinks. Why'd you call me then, right? But then he goes on. I don't have anything to give you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. I, 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 don't, I don't have exactly what you're looking for, but what you're looking for is not really what you need. But I'll give you what I do have. And I think that should be the attitude of every believer. I don't have everything, but what I do have, I'm offering it to God to be used by him. I've got time. I've got resources. I've got money. I've got influence. I've got a talent. God, it's all yours to be used by you. God, I'm going to give you everything and give it to the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And it's powerful that it's in the name of Jesus. It wasn't in the name of Peter and John. It wasn't even, it, it was Jesus. You see, when we started this message, we talked about Jesus first, knowing God. Knowing God. All of us need a relationship with him. In order for us to know him, we've got to get there through Jesus. See, Jesus knew that there was a, a, a gap between us and him. Knew that there was a distance between us and him. And he didn't sit idly by. He actually did something. That sin had separated us, and he says, you know what, I'm going to pay the price. He saw, he felt, he heard our life, and then he did something by laying his life on the cross for us. And so he gave his life that we may have a relationship with God. And that's an incredible example for us today. 
And it's something that every single one of us should take advantage of. Jesus, you gave your life for me. I'm going to give my life back to you. That Bible calls that salvation. So this morning, if you've never done that, that's the greatest gift you could ever give. Forget time, forget money, forget everything else. The most extravagant thing you can give is your life to God. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. We're going to pray a simple prayer. And this is you talking to God. Not listening to me, you talking to God. I'm going to help you with the words, but it's really simple. God, I give you my life. Forgive me of everything in my past. I want to know you. I want to be used by you. I want to find freedom in you so that I can change the world through you. So why don't you pray this prayer with me? God, I pray that you would forgive me. Forgive me my past for the things that have distanced me from you. Thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to forgive me, to take my place, that I may be made new in you. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. And I pray that as I find freedom in you, you would use me to change the world. That it would make a difference. In your name we pray. Everybody says, amen. Why don't you put your hands together for the people that just prayed that prayer.